I'm Sue Hostetler. I'm the chair of the board at the Anderson Ranch, and I am here to welcome you for a lecture by the amazing Paul McCarthy. Um, I do also want to ha uh, send a, a warm welcome to two special guests, Karen, um, Paul's wife and producer and collaborator, and Alexis Karen, the director of Hauser & Wirth. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, Paul McCarthy is widely considered to be one of the most Im influential, groundbreaking, and certainly provocative contemporary American artists. He is known for visceral, of often hauntingly humorous work in a variety of mediums, from performance, photography, film and video, to sculpture, drawing, and painting. Whether absent or present, the human figure has been a constant in his work, either through the artist's own performances or the array of characters he mixes to high and low culture and provokes an analysis of our fundamental beliefs. His playfully oversized characters and objects cre critique the worlds from which they are drawn. Hollywood, politics, philosophy, science, art, literature, and television. In addition to his art practice, Paul taught performance, video, installation, and art history in the new genres department at UCLA for 18 years, where he certainly influenced future generations of West Coast artists and he has ex exhibited extensively worldwide. Uh, I personally, probably like a lot of you, have followed his career for a long time, um, but what really uh, became, an, uh, he became an obsession when he took over the entire Park Avenue Armory in 2013 for his show WS. Um, it was daring, it was slightly demented, and a fantastical fairy tale gone wrong. And to me, I guess it was kind of um, lampooning the American dream and our pop culturally obsessed world. Um, after this, Paul, you moved right to the top of our list at the Anderson Ranch, and we have been wanting you to come for, for all those years, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, but before turning over the microphone, I would like to thank Toby Devin Lewis, our presenting sponsor, and Ulite Arts, our premier sponsor, and all of our National Council sponsors, our corporate and media partners, and all of you that help support the important work that we do here at the Anderson Ranch. And if you're not yet a uh, member of the National Council, please sign up on your way out today. So please help me in welcoming the irrepressible artist, Paul McCarthy. That's it? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm starting with uh, an image from 1964 or 5 when I was in college. Um, and it, so it's a long career of making art and uh, the question for, for me is when you go to talk about your work and uh, you're gonna reduce it to 45 minutes, how do you do it? And how do you kind of, in a way I, I said last night that uh, I see my work as a, as a continuum. Like one piece leads to the other, 1964, 65 relates to right now and uh, if I talk about something I'm doing now, which in a way I can, a lot of times it leads to the past. And so when I was doing this, I was trying to narrow it down to just one or two pieces that I'm working on now. And at one point I went, what the hell, I'll just show slides until it, or uh, show images until we run out of time. <laughs> and um, so we'll see how, I'll try to go pretty fast and try to get you to where I'm, what I'm doing now. But, um, so this is uh, 1964, it's, it's uh, well, 65. And I th at that time, I'm beginning to be aware of uh, Vietnam and the war and uh, it's part of, I end up in a school that's quite radical in the sense of both art and politics. And it's very weird because it's the University of Utah and who would think that? And uh, it just was a short period of about three or four years where the art department became Marxist and was uh, interested in experimental film. So the, the, drawing, the drawing classes became uh, experimental film classes, Andy Warhol, Yoko Ono, all these things, Stan Brackish, Stan Vanderbeek, these were all names thrown around in the, in the art department. 
And at the same time, you're in the midst of minimalism and pop art and hard edge painting, Frank Stella, Kenneth Nolan, all this stuff. So uh, you're in the midst of a smorgasbord. And as a young student, it all made sense to me. It wasn't that I was going to be a minimalist. It wasn't that I was a hard edge painter. It wasn't that I was just interested in all of it. So the work. In a way, that's never stopped. Um, this idea of mediums, uh, whatever medium, the idea of uh, content seemed to be the overriding trajectory, I think. Medium and styles just went everywhere. Um, this painting is up there mostly because uh, I set it on fire or began to burn it. Uh, the next series of paintings, which go on till 1968, I'm burning my paintings. The final paintings that made in 67, 68, were all black. And essentially, they were made by pouring gasoline on them and light them on fire. Not to burn them completely, but just turn them black. And uh, at the time, I didn't know of Yves Klein. I didn't know, I knew of Alan Capro course. Uh, I knew of Alan Capra by 1966. And I knew of Gustav Metzger and the Destruction and Art Symposium uh, that took place in London. So the idea of destruction and art made sense to me. And, um, but I really didn't, I didn't understand that by burning my paintings, uh, I really, it was, it took me a while to realize, well, that's a, a process that uh, the idea of art and process became really uh, instrumental for the next 50 years. The idea of process, and also the idea of effect. And uh, so this is a very early burnt painting with the image of an airplane. The, the airplane is reminiscent. My uncle was in World War II, and as an early kid, he gave me a bunch of cards of uh, military planes of World War II. So the subject of war became, and I became really interested philosophically in the psychology of fascism. Uh, but this is 1968. Um, in school, there's a lot of minimalism going on. And of course, minimalism in the Judd sense, Donald Judd, and minimalism in the Clement Greenberg sense of the pure object. <clears throat> and uh, at the time, it was like I didn't get it, because I was making minimalism in relationship to the figure. This was called the dead H. And H, in the drawing, it says dead H. H is for human. So I equated everything I did to the human figure, even in these minimal objects. And the idea of this piece, the dead H, was that you could, once the piece was made, you could never access the center. I made a void in which you could no longer access, which I equated with the human body. In a sense, how do we access our, our interior? And the other one is, how do we access our mind? You know? And we, don't, we still don't understand how vision works. But, um, and it was hollow. So, it, and then the word, I made an H, and then the letter H stands for human. So, minimalism and human. This was the same period. It's a card hanging from a string. And this is an early photograph of it. Now the piece has been shown a lot, so there's a smudge mark where your nose goes, because you stand at it, and you look through the two holes and the piece was inherently about inside outside. Uh, at the time, I was really interested in minimalism. By making a minimal object, you made a void. <clears throat> and you made a void you couldn't access. You made an inside. So there was the inside and the outside. And all that defined the inside and the outside was the skin. And in my, you know, in a formal way or in a a very simplistic way. And this piece, the card just spins. So if you walk up to it and look through it, which really was about the existential crisis for me of looking out of eye, eye sockets. When you walk up to it, 
there is no front and there is no back. It only is determined by your position. The minute you walk up to it, you determine an inside and an outside. And, uh, you know, for me that was significant. It was dealing with, an, with something. Um, okay, so we skip. I'm skipping big blocks of time. So that kind of work went on for quite a while. Uh, I, we, Karen and I both go through a number of schools from Utah to San Francisco, back to Utah, finally end up in LA. And I end up in the art film school at USC. And uh, this is a piece where I, I, I make a lot of pieces about painting. You know, I burnt paintings. Now, this is called making a white line with your head or your face. So they become more performative, and they're, a lot of them are pretty structural or repetitive action. Um, this one is uh, where I pound a hole in the wall, put my head in the wall and my left hand in the wall, and plaster my head and hand in the wall. And so when people came in the room, I'm stuck in the wall. You know? <laughs> And um, these kinds of pieces go on for, uh, I don't know how many pieces. I, 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 in school, in the University of Utah, there was a lot about filmmaking, and I'm 16 millimeter, eight millimeter cameras, all this. The real thing I wanted was my hands on video. And uh, at that point in the early 60s, getting your hands on cameras was pretty difficult, and video cameras. and. Um, so by the time I get to uh, LA, I get my hands on camera. So these kinds of pieces begin the video pieces of 1970 to 72, 73. And most of them are body related. Uh, and uh, act, you know, performances, very sculptural, very painterly uh, repetition, stuff like that. So um, then what happens in 1974, the work changes. And when the work changes, I've always said that it changed because of liquids. And um, two things happen. Uh, I, the repetitive thing stays in there, but a form of narrative happens in which First thing that happens, I cover the face in some way, glasses, uh, some kind of mask. Uh, the second thing is that instead of being uh, like a, a concept, put your head in the wall and left arm, they become improvisational uh, uh, continuums going on from 20 minutes to several hours. Uh, this one was done as if I was a, a stand-up comic. I made a kind of funny little restaurant, and I shaved the hair on my body, stick foot-long hot dogs in my mouth, and uh, so it's called Hot Dog. Um, kind of, this is part of Hot Dog. Um, during that period of time, I probably do uh, from 1973 to 1983, I probably do 30, 40 of these kinds of performances uh, around the world. And um, uh, <clears throat> they, they eventually, this, uh, at one period, this one's called Grand Pop. It, they started off with pieces where I, in a way, it, it, the, the subject of androgyny was really interesting to me, or the subject of self-fantasy. I become a female, or I pretend to be a female as a male. Then it switched to animals. I do all these pieces where I'm a monkey, a dog, a pig. And then it went to the patriarch. And uh, this one's grandfather, Hollywood Halloween, it's called. And... Uh, this one's called Sea Captain. And so the patriarch stayed as a subject uh, till today. It's still the male patriarch. Male conditioning. 
exactly. Uh, so, okay, I'm moving quite fast. So now we're at 40 performances have been done and some 20, 30 videos or something. And I, during that period of time, I'm not doing much drawings. I do drawings of performances or what I might do, but the drawing thing is kind of, uh, and painting, I'm not painting as much. And in 1983, uh, the art world changes, in my view. Uh, Paula Cooper, no, Mary Boone happens, painting comes back, the art world of the alternative uh, has nowhere to go, people are lost, uh, ob you know, like, do you want to be part of a gallery? The gallery system becomes more, comes back, uh, I believe, uh, Reaganomics at the same time. And... Um, this piece was a sculpture in which all the videotapes that I'd made during the 70s were put in cardboard boxes and stacked up as a sculpture. And I didn't view it as, and then the videos were, you were not allowed to open the boxes. If you own the pieces, you can't open the boxes. So the piece is, it contains that period of work. And then this one contained all the, this was, called the trunks. It contained all of the relics that I still had from doing performances at the, that period. So these two pieces became the encapsulation of up to the 80s, that all the relics went into the trunks. You're not allowed to open the trunks. All the videos went into the three boxes. They were two pieces. Both of them were stacks. Uh, I repeatedly have made pieces where I stack things. Uh, and also this one, at the top of it, it has a thing called the human object. And it's uh, a figure that I'd used in a performance. And I put it at the top. I kind of viewed this thing like a boat. That in a sense, all that period of time was some sort of journey into a subconscious. That's a little too literal and a little too grandiose, and uh, uh, you don't have to believe it, but uh, it did remind me of a ship into the underworld, and uh, from that point, I was interested. Not so far that, you know, did I enter the underworld? Well, who the hell knows? Um, those are some of the relics. I mean, there were a lot, this is all I had left. A lot of it was just left at wherever I did the performance. If it was in Europe, I would just leave them in the room but this is what was left. And at one point I photographed all of them and it turned into a series of photographs. Uh, then I take a kind of break, two kids, uh, no money, and that, that exists from about 70, uh, I mean about 83, and then in 1990, I, I do a videotape of Mike Kelly in 87, and then in 90 I make this piece which was called The Garden, and it was made in a show called uh, Helter Skelter, by Paul Schimmel did it. And it's, uh, the trees came from Bonanza, the TV show, and the rocks were all move in part of movies. And inside is an older man humping a tree, and you can see the younger man in the corner humps the ground. Essentially, a, a, a piece about male conditioning. The older man teaches the younger man how to fuck up nature. And <laughs> uh, the part about it that was interesting to me was it, it had to do with a TV show I saw in which uh, they talked about Belize watching the Chicago Cubs. And I, it was really like, wow, like a light bulb went off. In a sense, what was happening is America looks inward but never looks outward, has no idea. But the, the, the outside, the rest of the world is looking at America. And in this case, these two characters don't look out. And the viewer walking around the piece peers in. And a sense it's a voyeurism on the, for the viewer. Uh, I make that piece, and then I make, I get a set, and I make, I use a set from a television show, uh, like a, a, a throwaway set, came from a family, uh, oh, I can't remember what the TV show was. It was where the teenagers hung out, it's called Bossy Burger, that was the name of the restaurant, and they made a piece, and I'm Alfred E. Newman. 
And, um, it's a, and at that point, it now goes back to the early minimal pieces in that I've now created a closed space in which the character never leaves. And uh, I viewed this like a sculpture. The set was a sculpture. And in a sense, um, it, for me, reminiscent of minimalism. Uh, and, the, and for me, there was the thing of the, of the box and, and the, the subject inside. In this case, the subject becomes a consciousness or a dream. And uh, so that starts the next body of work, uh, which involves sets. Santa Claus, uh, I'd made a number of pieces about Santa Claus. Uh, the elves also making pieces with other people. Um, Melinda Ring, she's a, a quite a well-known dancer. And we made a number of pieces together. Uh, I'm skipping a lot now. Between the Santa Claus and here is like five, six things. Uh, this is a piece made with Mike Kelly in Vienna, Austria. And we set up this military thing. We found out we were both interested in uh, Sad Sack, the comic strip, but for completely different reasons. For Mike, it was the comic that he read as a child, and it had a lot to do with, uh, with shit and, uh, and an abject. And for me, it had to do with a book that a friend gave to me, which was uh, given to the military in World War II, the, uh, the American military, U.S., and it was, uh, it essentially, it positioned the Japanese as chinks, it was all chinks, and very racist book. And so there were two things that, there were, it signified two different things for each of us. Often the pieces Mike and I made took completely different trajectories and came back together. But we make this piece around Sunset. And uh, at one point, I did this thing where I piled butter all over the place. And, uh, the butter still exists. The piece still exists. The butter looks like this. It's kept in a, a refrigerated container and uh, is still there. Uh, Mike as an alien. Me as uh, a politician. Uh, now I've skipped again, about five, ten years. And this is a piece uh, when Bush came into office, right when we went into Iraq. And I did it in a bank in uh, London, in Piccadilly. It was called Piccadilly. And it's uh, a piece around George Bush and, uh, and the Queen. And it's in this old bank. And that became, after this piece, it became the gallery for Hauser and Wirth. But um, uh, these are these paintings I made with these two queens. <laughs> this, I then show the piece in the bank. And the piece is just left in the space. And the videos, it was a very high ceiling, like 20 some odd feet. And the videos were shown around the room like that, right? And um, multi-channel video uh, of the performance with the objects. Um, the problem with the piece was in the bank that underneath was a bunker, I mean a basement. And the basement was, had a vault. And we had said, my son and I, we made it together. And when we first went there to see the bank, it was when Bush had gone into Iraq, bin Laden had been identified. And I jokingly said, and it was called, there was a room upstairs called the American Room. And I just jokingly said, uh, uh, Bush, Bush in the bank, you know? So like I, I said to Ivan, I was with the, the director of uh, House of Worth, I said, well, Bush should be in the bank. I hadn't said I was gonna make a film yet. I just said, Bush should be in the bank. 
And then I go, and the queen should be upstairs in the American room. And my son sat in Bin Laden in the basement. And we both went, whoa, we can't do that. Uh, too literal, too uh, what at that time, right? And so, as it turns out, we decide to do it. And uh, Bush and the Queen and Bin Laden were in the bank, and the Queen was upstairs. And when we, we didn't touch the basement, and then when we got, when I was on the plane going back to the United States, I thought, what the hell? You didn't deal with the basement. So we came back and built the basement in our studios and did the second part, which was called Bunker Basement. And uh, there's Bush and the Queen. Yeah, OK. So that piece, but all of these pieces, you know, the videotapes take these kinds of pieces. They, the performances last for five, six, seven days, these pieces. And the videos usually are in the range of, you know, eight to 10 hours, something like that, and 20, 30,000 photographs. And uh, so you're missing, you're not seeing the whole thing. Um, right after that, I start on a piece uh, based on, my son Damon said we should make a piece about Pirates of the Caribbean. And um, this is before the Johnny Depp thing happened, like a couple of years before. In fact, I'm convinced they stole our idea. But <laughs> <clears throat> um, So we build a boat. We had all the intentions of floating the boat in the Salton Sea and all this. We never did. Uh, but we build this big boat. That boat's about, uh, it's about 20 feet tall and 50 or 60 feet long. And uh, we did a piece called Caribbean Pirates. And um, this is in the studio. And it was really based on this one scene, two scenes in Caribbean Pirates. One is, is uh, the scene in which, as a viewer or in a boat, you go underneath a bridge in which there's a invasion of pirates of the village. And uh, it seemed you could connect the invasion into Iraq or the invasions uh, of any population and another population um, with this Caribbean pirate image. And so this, this plywood thing across there was really indicates the bridge at the Disneyland, and the camera would pass underneath the boat. The performance uh, went on for, I think this one, like 15 days. That's me. Uh, part of the piece was uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? In a sense, uh, she represented, uh, along with her husband, uh, the industrialists that would back the war. Uh, not that I have anything against Elizabeth Taylor, but it just seemed, I don't even know how it ended up that way, actually. Uh, these are scenes out of the, the boat. Um, okay, uh, after that I, I make, uh, I start trying to make an island of pigs and I spent, a lot of what we do is in the studio rather than fabric. The only thing I send out is bronzes. Everything else is done in the studio. And this is a robotic pig, which I then spent like five years making, I think, or three years, something like that. And it's a sleeping pig. It, it, the legs move, the ears move, the eyes move, the nose move, it breathes. And the, the entire mechanism to move everything is the base of the piece. Uh, after that, I make a piece based on Snow White. And I'm Walt Disney, and uh, uh, Elise Popper's plays uh, Snow White. And <clears throat> it's called White Snow. Uh, Andy Warhol influence. Uh, the end of the night. 
And this is, it was done in a big set with a forest. Uh, the trees are like 30 feet high. The, the set that you're looking at there is a set of, that is my parents' house. Um, the carpet, the, all the car, we carpeted the entire room. It's a giant room. The ceiling is 70 feet high, to give you some view of what that is. All the carpet comes from Disney hotels. The screen was like 150 feet long. It was, uh, it's 35 hours long, the video. Uh, from that, I made a lot of sculptures. They're referred to often as spin-offs. And uh, this is the head of Snow White. That's about six feet tall, I guess. Uh, it's silicone, yellow silicone. Uh, prior to that, early on in, uh, I don't know, 90, I don't know what year this is. Uh, I don't know. Um, mid-90s, I guess. I think it's mid-90s. It's a, it was a piece based on Jeff Koons's Michael Jackson. I really, I sat on a panel once in which the discussion of Koons came up, and there was real, it was between they loved Michael Jackson or they didn't, critical. And I jokingly, at the end of the panel, sitting at the end, said, well, I think every artist should do it and it's the pieta of our time. And, uh, and then I got up and thought, wow, I should make it. And I, because I really love the Kuhn's piece. And I like the idea that, is it a critique or is it an honor? Or a, like, a, am I praising it? Like, where does Paul stand here by making this piece? And I really did love the piece, but, and it's called Michael Jackson Fucked Up. Uh, this is about the same time. That's, I turned my entire studio upside on its side. You, that's the inside of my studio. So everything that was in my studio went on the wall. And it's everything, drawings, videotapes, uh, editing machines, ladders, everything. And uh, when you go stand on those boxes, essentially, you can look through the window, which is actually the window. So, you know, to make it, try to make it clear, this would be the floor of my studio, so the thing would go like that. So it seemed, you got it? So it's, and in the early 70s, I had made a series of photographs upside down, and also turning a chair upside down. So there was this, thing of reversing something, which abstracted it, but it also reversed, like the idea of reversing or turning something upside down. So there's that. Then I made this piece, which that pig that you saw, the mechanical pig, becomes, this becomes Pig Island in my studio. And at one point, I didn't, you know, everything on the foam blocks was the sculpture. And at one point, I couldn't even, it was hard to determine where it ended. Maybe it didn't end at the foam blocks. And I essentially worked up on it for, oh, several years. That's a view from the looking down on it, like a mandala, I think. So these are parts of it. That's a life cast of me with the head of George Bush. So I, I kind of think, you know, uh, who's to blame here, you know? Angelie Jolie. Uh, <clears throat> this is, a, I started making bronze pieces at one point. I was really against bronze for a long time. It seemed so traditional. And, and then I kind of got into it. They were almost all black for a long time. And this is a sad, it, this came from a Santa Claus that a friend had given me for Christmas, a tiny Santa Claus. And in, when I was in college, I'd put a butt plug on a chair 
and it was called uh, a Broncusi on a pedestal. And it was really because the butt plug actually looked like a Broncusi or an ARP, you know. And it was really just screwing with low and high. It was just literally taking the lowest thing and putting it on the highest thing. Taking low culture and making it, equating it to Broncusi. And I, it had fallen off the chair, and it was on my desk with the Santa Claus. Santa Claus was about 12 inches. And at one point, I got asked to do a public sculpture. And I kind of rejected the idea, then realized that the butt plug that had been on the chair actually fit right over the Christmas tree that the Santa Claus was holding. And uh, I put the butt plug over the, Santa, over the tree. And I never thought somebody would make it. And, uh, you know, uh, Amsterdam made it. No, not Amsterdam. Uh, Rotterdam did. Uh, just this year, uh, a new one made this. The original was made of uh, styrofoam and clay. The original styrofoam I had kept outside for a long time. And so I got asked to do a piece in Norway. And so instead of molding or casting from the original, I made a mold of the styrofoam piece and cast that in bronze. The original was supposed to be made, painted red, but they ran out of money. So this one got painted red. And it ended up, we put it in a roundabout in the middle of Norway, in Oslo. These are dwarfs made, oh no, this is a pirate. These are, no, that's a dwarf, I think, um, in bronze. These are all dwarves. And they're black bronze. And these are the original clay pieces, like, like that. I think it's, oh, it's one of those, I think. So the original clay in which I keep, I, I, I like the originals a lot. These are silicone dwarves. And then this is a show, and on this side are the clay ones, and on this side are the bronze ones, sort of like a chess match, right? And the bronze is raw bronze, so it's not patinaed. And I like that, it, it'll change over time. If you touch it, parts go black. But I like all that, it's, uh, you know, raw bronze. So they, look, they don't look like bronze, they look like another material. Then I made these wood pieces. That's about, oh, I don't know, 13 feet tall. And these were all done uh, computer CNC machines and uh, then carved in laminated uh, walnut. And I made quite a few of these pieces. A wood piece. Relate, these pieces are all related to uh, white snow or snow white. The prints in snow white. Prints and a, and a deer and a rabbit. Um, there's a group of them. Those, these two here are, uh, I, I think the total weight is 40,000 pounds and they're about 14 feet tall. Wood. And then I made them in bronze, again, another snow white, a different configuration. And I patinaed them red. This one's called Singularity. This one's called The Party. And then uh, about, I'm, so I'm skipping a lot, okay? But this it was made about, it was made over a two year period in my studio. It's called Remington Bronze. I mean, Remington. Uh, oh. Ah, can't remember. Can't remember. Bronston, sorry. The, and I, it, it had to do with, 
these Remington sculptures, these Western Remington sculptures in all of the Oval Offices of every president. So I started reproducing Remingtons. And then I had made this sculptured head of Bron uh, Charles Bronston, and I stuck it up on top. And um, it's, uh, how tall is it? Uh, 16? Yeah, maybe 18 feet tall. It's really quite big. And then this one was made this year. It is called the Oval Office. Okay, now we get to the last couple of years. Um, I started making these films, uh, most of them have not been shown um, in the art world, per se. But um, this one was, I started making a film about uh, Stagecoach, the John Wayne movie. I wasn't really, I only watched the movie twice in my life. I was not really interested in it. Uh, what I was interested in was the six people in this box traveling across the West. And uh, so it's, uh, this is how we, we, we either pulled it by horses or pulled it by truck. And I viewed it as a sculpture. The piece still exists like this. And again, it goes back to the dead H or skull with a tail or uh, the skull card or uh, a set, like a, 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 an object, a contained object with an inside. And uh, so we would, the six of us would be in this thing going in a big circle, about a three mile circle for like three days in the film. And we would do the same scenes over and over again. Okay. Um, that's me. Uh, I'm Ronald Ray Gunn, Ray Gunn, uh, Nancy Ray Gunn, uh, Jesus Christ in pink, Mary Magdalene in red, Adam and Eve on the other side. The six of us travel, and it's essentially about libertines. Uh, the Ronald Ray Gunn and Nancy Reagan, Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene abuse Adam and Eve. And it's the abuse of the privilege of the underprivileged, libertines. Uh, this is the rape of Adam by Mary Magdalene and Ronald Reagan. Also luncheon on the grass, I guess. You know. Uh, later we move, I build this set, which is called the Way Station, which still exists in my studio uh, and is considered a sculpture with an interior. The interior has remained the same for three, four years. The tubes, everything are part of the piece. And the characters move to uh, the interior of the Way Station where they have a series of parties. Uh, part, the theme of party has occurred over and over again in pieces. Uh, Mary Magdalene. At one point, Ronald Reagan and Mary Magdalene stick flowers up Adam's ass. Ronald Reagan. The piece then continued where they go back into the stagecoach and they travel through the West again. And late at night, they're uh, stopped by four men dressed in white, called the white men. And they're, over a period of three days, they're tortured and killed, all of them. Uh, we'll pop back to something normal. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> this, uh, I made a Henry Moore when I think I was 15. I, I, I know I was 15. I think how I knew exactly about Henry Moore, I'm not sure of. The other part to that, I've tried to find a Henry Moore that looks like this. There isn't one. So it's some sort of version of a Henry Moore. 
and I was asked to be in the Whitney Biennial, and I asked if I could use the Whitney as a, a pedestal for a sculpture I made when I was 15. And it's an inflatable, it's 75 feet tall, it's quite a big inflatable. Uh, Santa Claus had a butt plug, uh, 90 foot inflatable. Uh, this one got me in a bit of trouble, but it's a butt plug uh, as a Christmas tree uh, in Paris. Uh, okay, so uh, after, when we got through shooting the Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan, Jesus Christ, Mary Magdalene, Trump ran for office, and I switched the characters. Ronald Reagan becomes uh, a kind of, is referred to as Donald Duck. Mary Magdalene becomes Daisy Duck. Uh, the characters all switch to new characters, and we begin to film again. And we start back in the stagecoach again. And Adam becomes Andy Warhol. Eve becomes uh, Donald Duck's daughter. And we shoot it at a green screen. Stagecoach again. The end of the stagecoach, a shot from above. Then uh, I decided to uh, have Donald Duck, Daisy Duck, uh, Bonkers, uh, <clears throat> the characters from the stagecoach, Andy Warhol, would occupy a saloon. So I built this saloon in my studio next to the way station. And it's a replica, inside is a replica of, of um, uh, Rainer Fassbinder's uh, film Whitey, which is, I think, a really great film about, uh, it's like a spaghetti western based on racism in America made by a German director. And they used a saloon in Spain, which was actually a saloon used by Clint Eastwood's, the Clint Eastwood series uh, <clears throat> of spaghetti westerns. So we rebuilt the whole saloon. Uh, that's it. You can see the way station in the back. So now the studio has four of these uh, big sets in it, which I view as sculptures. Uh, the characters, Minnie Mouse and Heidi join in. Uh, Donald. Donald and Daisy. This interior of the saloon. Uh, John Wayne, he, the one character plays John Wayne, and uh, Bonkers, the daughter. The film is shot, the entire film is shot over 65 days. Uh, there's 150,000 still photographs and 150 terabytes of video. We think that's an enormous amount. So the editing of the piece will probably go on for uh, four or five years. Uh, Andy Warhol. Um, after that, uh, this is the last, that's not the last piece I've made, but it's the last one I'm showing. It's a piece where uh, I, um, several years ago, I ended up working with this actress. It's the one kneeling down that is nude. And we were doing a thing in Berlin, and I jokingly said, wow, this looks like the night porter, the scene, this setting, right? And I jokingly said, we should remake it, never thinking that I actually would. And then about, I don't know, six months later, we got asked to make a film, to produce a film, a remake of The Night Porter, and in Vienna. 
And we started working on it. Um, and then it, after several, almost, I don't know, several months, the festival fired the director. And in firing the director, the entire city stopped all funding. And we lost all funding for the project. Um, and we'd been working on it for about uh, six, nine months, something like that. And we decided we would just go ahead. And we sold some work of other artists that we own and financed the piece and went ahead. But I had changed the piece. So it was no longer about the original theme of the Night Porter. It was about, it became about a, a German actress who comes to Los Angeles and ends up in a party done by a producer who uh, takes advantage of, he's not really interested in making films, he's interested in the, ac the access it gives him to human beings. And uh, crazy, Weinstein happened. And uh, it's happened before, when I made the Snow White, lo White Snow, lo and behold, Disney makes Snow, I mean, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, sorry. Disney makes it. So it's these things, these kind of coincidences have happened. So this piece is about, and at that point, I had begun to switch my interest from direct political people, like Bush or Trump or something like that, to the subject of organized crime. And so the character I play in this is much more connected to organized crime. In a sense, uh, global politics now being the world of glo organized crime. And uh, uh, so we make this piece about organized crime and fascism. And fascism became the subject for the next body of work. And so she comes to LA where she uh, goes on an audition, uh, forced to sign a contract. This is me. Goes to a party. The party's about getting drunk. Um, the party goers. Disintegrate. At one point, the producer cuts her hair off. The producer, then they become fascists. Fascists with cameras. Fascism. In the end, uh, she uh, kills him. So uh, that's the last image. So the piece, uh, I'll end it with something more positive. Let's find a more. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, they're having a good time. Um, so this piece now is shot in a very large set called The Maze. It's where these people never get out. Um, the set includes the rooms of Max, the character in the, night, the film The Night Porter made in 1974 or something. The Marriott Hotel where Lilith, who plays the main character, stayed when she first came to LA. And we ended up with a set from the Beverly Hills Hotel, which then is where the party takes place. So the set itself is about 100 feet long and 40 feet wide or so, and it's called the maze. And it's really where people enter this thing and don't come out, which is very much how I see the situation that we exist in. So that's it. Paul, thank you. Would you be willing to take a few questions? Sure. There are a few microphones, if you can wait till a microphone finds you. We'll come to uh, 
When you were younger and starting your artistic journey, what did you define as a successful piece of work? Or what were your definitions of success? <clears throat> Definition of success. I, of someone else, do you mean, or of myself? Or of myself. Uh, I don't know. I, I could. It, it's that's a. I don't know how I actually answer that. Other than, I know that uh, I was in college, right? And um, there was a point where me, I, I went on my own. And uh, I started, when I started the burnt paintings, really burning them black, I thought I found something. So uh, there's always been this thing of the unexpected and believing in the unexpected as uh, what's critical. And uh, the going from the airplane painting to the all black paintings or the burnt paintings of 67, 68, 69. There was something that just said, okay, uh, school's over. You know? And I guess I, that was the first real sense of uh, I was doing something. And it meant something to me. Like it, the parts fit together. It, it, all the parts fit together, those black paintings. I later burned them all. And, uh, there's only three that exist now. I burnt them in my grandfather's uh, field. Um, thank you for such a, a wonderfully courageous uh, slide lecture. I appreciate it very much. If I'm remembering correctly, you've had some really interesting lawsuits in your career. And how have they affected your work? I haven't. I haven't had any lawsuits, really. No, there was uh, at one point, I mean, I can tell the story. When I made this big inflatable in front of the Tate, uh, it had the body of a Pinocchio. It wasn't a body from what we knew was a Disney Pinocchio. It was a, from a, a, a plaster figurine bought in Mexico, right? And I made, I read, so the body was that and the head was a box. And at one point there was a, a threat came that Disney would sue us. The Tate backed down completely and wanted me to sign uh, an agreement that I would take all responsibility for it. And when that happened, I said, take it down, you know. Uh, and it really was, if the institution asks you to do something, you're in it together. It's a collaboration. It's, we're not in there. Now it's all Paul. Paul takes the responsibility. And it's no, the Tate has to take it too. And I said, take it down. And uh, the Tate said, we won't take it down. We'll, we'll fight it too. And nothing ever happened. And so uh, these things have come up. Uh, you know, it's, it's a crazy thing with Disney. It's such an influential thing on culture. It affects so much, and it signifies something. And signifies, uh, you know, even when it isn't doing something, when it isn't affecting, when it isn't conditioning, it signifies it. And for me, it's like, they're fair game. Like, you have to critique it. You have to try to understand what it is. Even if it's, I mean, critiquing is one thing. You know, if you think of it as an onion and you're trying to peel it away to understand it, like, I think it's the responsibility of people to peel the onion to try to understand what kind of situation we're in. And uh, Disney is fair game. Like, they, we need to peel the onion as to what this is. Um, you had a wonderful relationship artistically with uh, Mike Kelly. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit more on how it started, how you fed off each other, and how you influenced each other? Uh, well, 
I, you know, Mike was uh, younger, 10 years younger, and I knew Mike from CalArts. Uh, the, the, the generation of CalArts in the late 70s, uh, Tony Osler and Jim Shaw and all that. And we had met a couple of times, and we kind of both knew we were interested in a similar subject. And we said, oh, one day we should do something together. And like years went by, and then uh, in 87, I got asked to do a, a videotape in a, in a uh, cable station. And I kind of knew I wanted what I, I was going to kind of be a, uh, like a Heidi character of some sort, like a grandfather character. And I just asked Mike, do you want to do it? And he said, sure, what should I be? And I said, I don't know. What if you're the son and I'm the father? And we just went in the studio and made this piece called Family Tyranny and Cultural Soup. And we had no, there was no uh, script, there was nothing. And that was the beginning. And then I think over a period of, I don't know, 20 years, we made eight or nine pieces together. And, uh, it, it, it's crazy about the effect we had on each other. What's more interesting to me than the effect, which is certainly there, we affected each other, I'm sure. But what was kind of crazy to me was we both made, uh, we both made the houses we grew up together at about the same time. And <clears throat> had no idea that we were doing it. And then when Mike died, um, the memorial was at our house and I was talking to one of the assistants and he said, uh, you know, when you go back to Detroit, you got to go in the underworld that Mike put in the house that he had made. He remade his parents' house and he had a big underworld. It went like three stories down, a concrete thing. And I was like, whoa, there's an underworld. He said, yeah. And what I didn't realize is that both Mike and I not only made our houses that we grew up to in about the same time, we both made underworlds in these houses. And I grew up in the basement. I lived in the basement. Uh, but we both made underworlds. So there was this crazy coincidence of remaking our parents' house and remaking an underworld. And then about a short period of time later, Mike begins to re to he was taking yearbook pictures and re taking the pictures and restaging what the picture looked like by hiring actors and clothing them so they look like the photograph. Day is done. And at the same time he was doing that. I was, I was obsessed with uh, Newport cigarette ads, what they were, how they were, how they depicted young people. And uh, I started remaking Newport cigarette ads where I would hire actors, dress them the same, and photograph them. So simultaneously, we're both taking images and redoing them, uh, one from yearbooks, one from advertising. A few years later, we both have shows in New York, and I do a series of big drawings. Mike does a series of paintings. In order to make the drawings, I left the big studio, went to a small studio, and made them in seclusion, not knowing at the same time Mike was doing it. So there was these, cra along with Sad Sock, Sad and Sadi Sock, uh, along with that. So, um, the coincidences were interesting to me, that we, in a way, made pieces very similar at the same time. Of course, he had an influence. You know. And it's sad if you look at the books. You know. We have one more question? Paul, thank you very, very much. Sure. It's great to have you here. Sue, our president, thank you for uh, introducing tonight.